He showed them his hands and his side. Words taken from the gospel for this octave of Easter, this low Sunday. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. In God's way of working with us, it is clear, as I hope to show you, that inasmuch as we have sipped or even taken deep drafts from the foaming and spicy chalice of this world, someone has to drink of the chalice of suffering before God will grant us his mercy. This is how God works. Before he's going to grant us healing, mercy, and peace, someone's got to drink of the chalice. And it's not just his majesty. The justice of God must be satisfied before his mercy and peace is bestowed. God's mercy removes blockages. It removes defects, roadblocks. But we must pay in to have this mercy bestowed upon us and our loved ones and upon the world. St. Augustine put it like this. God made us without us, but he will not save us without us. Now, the Protestants often take the ledger approach to salvation, like a, an accountant's ledger. One day, they are in the column of the debits, the losses. The next day, they've accepted our Lord. They are transferred to the column of the gains, just like that. No expiation and payment needed by anyone save alone His Majesty, Jesus Christ. But wait a minute, that's not how the Bible describes it, nor is it how St. Paul lived his life and all the saints afterward. Thus we hear in Colossians chapter 1, verse 24, this phrase gives the Protestants much room for wonder and pause because they don't know what to do with it. Here's what it says. I now rejoice in my suffering for you, and fill up those things that are wanting of the sufferings of Christ. St. Paul, I fill up those things that are wanting of the sufferings of Christ in my flesh for his body, which is the church. Colossians chapter 1, verse 24. St. Paul suffered for others. He suffered for members of the church so that they might receive the mercy from God. Remember Ananias, when God said, go baptize Paul? What did he say? But Lord, this is Paul. And he says, I will show him all that he must suffer. Clearly, God's mercy is not just a quick, easy thing. It's precisely why I'm preaching on this today, because so many people think it's like a lever, just, ch -ch -ch, I'm all done now. I know, it doesn't work quite like that. Once again, this is a very important principle. Inasmuch as we have sipped, or sad to say, taken deep drafts from the foaming and spicy chalice of this world, someone has to drink of the chalice of suffering before God will grant us his mercy, before God will grant us his healing and peace. Now let me provide... Three examples of this from recent times. We could go all the way back to St. Paul and start through all the saints if we wanted to, because it's true in every age, in every group of saints. But let's just go back about a hundred and some years, and we'll figure these things out and see it's true. So from the life of Blessed Alexandrina da Costa, she's a 20th century victim soul of Portugal. We learn how in 1941, she wrote to her spiritual director, Father Mariano Pinho, telling him that His Majesty had informed her thus, My daughter, a priest living in Lisbon is close to being lost forever. He offends me terribly. Call your spiritual director and ask his permission that I may have you suffer in a special way for his soul that I may have you suffer in a special way for his soul. Once Alexandrina had received permission from her spiritual director, she suffered gravely. She felt the severity of the priest's errors, 
how he wanted to know nothing about God and was close to despair and damnation. She even heard the priest's full name. Poor Alexandrina experienced a hellish state of this priest's soul and prayed urgently to God, not to hell, no, I will offer myself as a sacrifice for him as long as you want. Father Pino inquired of the Cardinal of Lisbon whether one of the priests of his diocese was in part of a particular concern. The Cardinal openly confirmed that one of his priests was, in fact, troubled, and he was very worried about him. When the Cardinal mentioned the name of the priest, it was the same one that His Majesty had spoken to Alexandrina. Some months later, a friend of Father Pinho, Father David Novis, recounted to him an unusual incident. Father David had just held a retreat in Fatima where attended a modest gentleman whose exemplary behavior made him pleasantly attractive to all the participants. On the last night of the retreat, this man suddenly had a heart attack. He asked to see a priest to whom he confessed and received viaticum. Holy Communion for the way. Shortly thereafter, he died, fully reconciled with God. It turned out that this man was actually a priest, the very priest for whom Alexandrina had suffered so greatly to purchase his soul. Another example, Sister Consolata Bertone, a Capuchin nun from Turin, his majesty said, your lifelong task is for your brothers. Consolata, you too shall be a good shepherdess and go in search of your brothers and bring them back to me. Her brothers were the shepherds of the flock, the priests. Sister Consolata offered everything for her brother priests and others consecrated to God who were in spiritual need. No matter what menial tasks she performed, she prayed continuously in her heart, Jesus, Mary, I love you, save souls. She consciously made every little service and duty into a sacrifice. His majesty said in this regard, your duties may be insignificant, but because you bring them to me with such love, I give them immeasurable value and shower them on the discontented brothers as grace for conversion. See, she's satisfying the justice of God through her love, and now he's granting graces. Very grave and difficult cases were often entrusted to the prayers of the convent, and Sister Consolata would take the corresponding suffering upon herself. For weeks or months on end, she came, she sometimes endured dryness of spirit, abandonment, meaninglessness, inner darkness, loneliness, doubt. These are things that make people want to run for it. This place is not for me, and they're out the door. No, she suffered all the sinful state of the priest who she suffered for. She once wrote of her, to her spiritual director during these struggles, how much the brothers cost me. Yet Jesus made her a magnificent promise. Consolata, it is not only one brother that you will bring back to God, but all of them. I promise you, you will give me the brothers one after another. And so it was. She brought back all the priests entrusted to her to a fulfilling priesthood. There are recorded testimonies of many such cases in this regard, directly linked to that convent and this sister. One last example. As early as 15 years old, the late 18th century Belgian-born Bert Petit began praying at every holy mass she attended for the priest. She would say, my Jesus, do not allow your priest to displease you. When she was 17 years old, her parents lost everything they had in a failed business venture. On the 8th of December, 1888, Bert's confessor explained to her that her vocation was not to enter a convent, but to stay at home and care for her parents. This was her duty. 
Although she accepted the sacrifice with a heavy heart, she wanted to be a nun. Beret asked Our Lady to intercede that Jesus might call a zealous and holy priest in place of her unfulfilled religious vocation. You will certainly be heard, assured her confessor. She could not have known that what would take place just 16 days later, a 22-year-old lawyer, Dr. Louis de Corsant, was praying before a statue of the Sorrowful Mother. Unexpectedly, he had an inner certainty, a grace, a signal grace, that it was not God's holy will to take the girl he loved to be his wife and to establish himself as a notary. He understood very clearly that God was calling him to be a priest. The call was so clear and urgent that he did not hesitate to give up everything. All the roadblocks were taken away. Upon finishing his studies and his doctorate in Rome, he was ordained to the priesthood in Paris in 1893. At the time, Berth was 22 years old. The same year, the the newly ordained 27-year-old priest celebrated the Christmas Midnight Mass in a church just outside of Paris. At the exact moment, Beret was participating at midnight mass in another church and solemnly promised our Lord, Jesus, I will be a sacrifice for the priests, for all priests, but especially for the priest of my life. During exposition of the most blessed sacrament, the young woman suddenly saw his majesty hanging on a large cross and Blessed Mary and St. John standing beneath it. Then she heard the words, Your offer has been accepted. Your prayer has been heard. Behold your priest. You will be able to meet him one day. And Bert saw that John's features resembled a priest, but one she did not know. This priest was none other than Father de Corsant whom she would recognize at their first encounter some 15 years later, in 1908. Berit made a pilgrimage to Lourdes, where the Blessed Virgin confirmed, Now you will see the priest whom you asked God for 20 years ago. You will meet him soon. That same year, she made another trip by train to Lourdes, this time with a friend of hers. A priest got on the train in Paris trying to find a place for a sick woman. It was Father de Corsant. His features were like those Bert had seen on St. John's face 15 years earlier. She had prayed frequently and offered all her physical suffering for him. After a couple of friendly words, he left the compartment. Exactly one month later, Father de Corsant also made a pilgrimage to Lourdes because he wanted to entrust the future of his priesthood to Our Lady. With suitcase in hand, he met Berit and her friend haphazardly, accidentally. Recognizing the two women, he invited them to Holy Mass. When Father de Corsant elevated the host, His Majesty interiorly spoke to Berit, This is the priest for whom I accepted your sacrifice. Shortly thereafter, Berit was able to speak to him about her interior life and another mission that was entrusted to her, the promulgation of the consecration to the Immaculate and Sorrowful Heart of Mary. Before 1917, before Our Lady came at Fatima, Father de Corsant felt that this precious soul had been entrusted to him by God. He accepted a position in Belgium and became a holy spiritual director for Berit Petit, as well as an untiring support for the realization of her mission. Theologically sound, he was the ideal person to maintain a correspondence between Beret and the hierarchy of the church in Rome. For 24 years until his death, he accompanied her in her expiatory vocation. She was often very sick and suffered especially for priests who had left the priesthood. Notice how in all three cases we just heard about, Our Lord himself asked for the participation of the faithful to bring about adequate justice for wrongs done to God. In these cases, about priests who offend God more than any others by their sacrilege. So that he then, in turn, might bestow his mercy, his healing, and his peace. 
Again, we say it again, inasmuch as men drink of the spicy, foaming chalice of this world, so too must they for someone, some faithful soul, drink of the chalice of suffering so that God's justice can be satisfied and mercy bestowed. This is how God has always worked with us. And this is how he works now, too. Let's do as these saintly souls have done. Offer up to God in union with Christ all our daily sufferings, trials, and tribulations to fill up what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ for his church. And we will not only save our own souls, but will save many others, having satisfied the justice of God so that his mercy can be bestowed and blockages removed and peace and healing granted. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.